cloud, connecting to the cloud, and we are now recording. So, all right, Anna, it's all yours. Welcome everybody to the April meeting of the Rio Rancho Astronomical Society. And uh, once again, we are uh, here at Groundhog Day, number whatever it is, for uh, having another vi uh, virtual meeting. It doesn't look like the numbers are really dropping all that rapidly in Sandoval County. So uh, I think we're going to continue to have uh, virtual events for the foreseeable future anyway. And, uh, you know, we can get as many as 10 people in a mass gathering. And so maybe that means we can do some things on a, to a limited degree. Uh, we are able to get out to the dark site every once in a while because we don't have that many takers going out to the dark site right now. Uh, but we had a, a pretty decent night out there uh, at the last night out at White Ridge. And uh, people who came had a pretty decent, decent sky to work with and no wind and got to tag some faint fuzzies out there. So um, think about that if you're, uh, even if you can't make it to a live meeting of the club, maybe we can see you out at the dark site once in a while out at White Ridge. Um, anyway, we're not gonna be planning any uh, massive get togethers or any uh, events that, that have, uh, let's say a famous astronaut participating at the meeting and talking to us because we just can't have anything with 100 people right now. So, uh, you know, kind of stay tuned and we'll, we'll see what's going on. Uh, there are, I don't know, some things happening in the background. Maybe I think Melanie can fill us in on some of what's going on with the, uh, for example, with our astronomical observatory we have, our outdoor observatory, which is currently uh, getting some maintenance. Melanie? Yes. Okay. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for me to go on to the next thing. Yes. Oh, uh, we picked all the benches up off the ground um, about a week and a half ago. It was the weirdest looking thing. If you guys have a Facebook account and have like and, and have liked the um, the Rio Rancho uh, Astronomical Society thing, you can see the benches all dovetailed together, all twelve of them on um, on a on a trailer, and they are at care coatings right now as we speak. Um, Funny story, when they were on their backs, uh, Winton, the guy who was the architect that actually designed our building, um, was looking at them. And some of them look really well welded. Some of them look like I welded them. And there was about four of them that the four legs, the, the square legs, each side was just tacked. And that's it. So we're like, oh, that's awesome. So when these tacks break, the whole bench is going to fall over because they're eight foot long metal and they are not light. And so what what um what Winton's going to do when the 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 coating company sandblasts them down to the to the bare metal, Winton's going to take a um his portable welder over and and is going to actually finish the welds that should have been welded by this guy that charged the city a decent amount of money for these benches and and left the city. And that's the state actually. So, but, you know, now I know why, but we won't discuss that out loud. I know I won't give you his name, you know, <laughs> although I still have it, but um, so they're, they're hopefully told him that we weren't going to be needing them as fast as we thought we were uh, because May the 15th, uh, even though it's national astronomy day, we have pushed our, um, our fundraiser thing that we're going to be naming the benches for Harrison Schmidt and naming the, um, the sundial for one of our founding members. Um, we had kind of tossed around maybe July, but we don't know that, you know, cause we're for space week, but I don't, I don't think that's, um, you know, we were talking about it and we think that that's probably not a good eye, a good date either. So we're going to push it to September the 11th, which is the, which is the date that we would have our, um, our night under the stars night, which we didn't have last year. So right now we have a stack of stuff that's for silent auction. I was actually messing with it the other night when we were up at the observatory. We've got some really cool stuff. We've got puzzles, we've got all kind of fun, um, you know, games and, and toys and that kind of stuff to be able to add to the, um, the silent auction. And I'm certain Jim will get, um, get stuff from Orion again, like, like he always does, because Orion is really good about sending this stuff for, for our silent auction and sending us a whole bunch of new astronomical toys that we can add to the silent auction. So um, when it gets a little bit closer, I'm going to start asking for, for folks to help out with maybe um, some donations for the silent auction and helping us organize stuff and helping us get the silent auction 
um, labeled and ready to roll. Um, it's going to be a little bit weird because right now we've got mass gatherings of 10. Um, so as long as we keep things outdoors in a tent, you know, we may have to get a Garcia tent to be able to, because we have two little easy up things, which might not be a big enough space to put silent auction plus still spacing. So we'll worry about that when it gets a little bit closer, but, um, you know, cross your fingers and hopefully that we can have something a little more normal um, in September. Um, in, in working toward that though, um, I wanna have a work day next Saturday, not tomorrow, but on the 24th at the observatory um, with the benches coming in, they're gonna be a different color. And, and so we're gonna paint the trim around the observatory um, to the, something to match the, the, it's, it's more, the benches are more blue than they are green, um, now. And it, they were kind of blue, but they had a little bit of green and the, 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 tint, the colors never were exactly right because the guy was crazy. Um, but, uh, but care coatings has given us, um, the swatch. And so we've actually exactly matched the building trim to the, to the benches. So if you want to come help paint, uh, help pick up a million, 1400 goat heads, um, you know, and just kind of work around the, the observatory it looks really strange because the benches aren't there so if we can kind of get that circle you know kind of kind of touched up and painted up again before, you know not painted up but kind of cleaned up before the benches come back it would be be kind of cool to to get that going on out there so around 10 o'clock next saturday uh please send me an email if you if you would like to come and help that way we kind of have an idea about how many are going to come um i'll get donuts and coffee and that kind of stuff to to keep everybody on a sugar high until we collapse at noon and go eat lunch and <laughs> come back and 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 finish up some more more stuff. But um, and we also need to to work on the telescopes a little bit too. So I think we've got a, a couple of new guys like Robin is was talking about uh, maybe possibly coming and taking a look at the telescopes and see see the the motors and stuff. So we've got all that stuff going on. Yay! Cool. Sounds good. There's uh, yeah, we have had issues with. Um, delinquents uh, tagging our benches. The, uh, if you haven't been to the observatory, these are very nice large metal benches that, you, that are arranged in a circle. And uh, they're, they're quite nice, but they also get marked up by the, uh, the local hooligans. And we're trying to make it a little bit easier this time around watch. by having coatings. Uh-oh. These guys. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, we'd like like to have some coatings on those benches that uh, can resist graffiti. So we'll have an anti-graffiti coating applied to this, to the benches this time. Should make them uh, resist some of what we were running into before. Awesome. 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 Yeah, I think that'll, that'll be, that'll help a bunch, I think. Melanie, you want to talk a little bit about what's in the observatory? You put that picture up. You can put, a, put it up again and oh, okay. show, show off some of the goodies um, there. Let me share back up there again. I'm not sure everybody's right. familiar with what's there. Um, this was the final project. We have uh, five young men that are, uh, I should I should do the talk I just did a little bit ago about the history of this observatory since it's now finally finished. Um, we have a, a patio out on the back, um, the back to the south side that has some name breaks in that we need to get another order in. I've got a couple of them that have been, have, that have been ordered that need to be picked out and, um, and, 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 embro and, and embroidered. <laughs> engraved <laughs> the other kind of embroidery <laughs> stone embroidery um but th these two telescopes uh, were donated by a family um of, of a guy named walter hiltbrenner he passed away um and the family didn't know what to do with him they were in a building at his house and we're like we'll take them and um then it ended up where the we it was a hugely long story. It was about nine or 10 years in the making between four mayors and, and all kind of gnashing of teeth and standing on one foot and, and, and bribery. And since I'm from Louisiana, I can do that really well. Um, and then the, the, final, the final big project was, was the benches. That was the city and the, there's an interactive sundial here in the middle with uh, you stand on the, on the month and your shadow tells the time. Um, this telescope was picked up from Rio Rancho High School. Um, as well as the 25 inch obsession was also picked up from Rio Rancho High School, uh, donated to their astronomy program there. And after all of the, um, the lights came up, it was kind of a, um, not, not really a, play, a good place to have the, the observatory anymore. And so we, we brought them out there and then we, um, 
we we now have have a roll off roof observatory out at Rainbow Park behind behind the building. It, you know, a lot of work, but it's it's a lot of community involvement. You know that we have had uh, businesses and and Boy Scouts and Julian Garza, the guy who owns all the McDonald's in Sandoval County, um, uh, talk to the county commission. So I mean, so we've we've got a lot of buy-in from this area for this for this observatory, which is nice. It makes it different than the one I built in, in Baton Rouge. That was just LSU, the park commission and the club. And LSU kind of kind of runs it where we're more in charge of this one, which is a much nicer situation. Right. And those uh, those vintage telescopes still need some TLC to get them working the way that they were intended to, to work. And some of the electronics is really outdated, and uh, we're going to need need some people that that understand mechanical things and electronic things to get those uh, working, you know, to, in the way we'd like to see them work, so that they can really be used at uh, any kind of public event we have. Yeah, the optics are fabulous. The the power and the tracking, not so much. So, um, Michelle, if you know anybody. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, um, and then let's see, next month, we have some stuff coming up. Um, National Astronomy Day is the 15th, and um, we were going to have our, our event then, but not so much. Uh, so we've got Jim Greenhouse scheduled to do something on that day. We're not real sure what. And then the night, the night before, on the 14th, uh, Larry Crumpler uh, from the Museum of Natural History, who actually worked on Mars 2020. You know, he's one of the guys working on, on Perseverance uh, right now, and um he actually had a, um, we had a, a event, a meeting last night that he was talking about ingenuity and they had, they were doing a, a test, a test run last night of the new software system that they have installed. And um, um, it looks like from what I can see, it looks like the test, the test was, was good. Um, so they, they spun the rotors for the first time on, on Mars and it looks like that was a good thing. So the next next process is spinning those four foot long rotors. Each blade is four feet long up to 2,400 RPMs. That's next. And that's that's you know what, just kind of leaving it on the surface, just testing the, the, the speed of the rotors. And then it'll lift off for the first time. And once it lifts off, it'll hover in place right a few feet off the surface and then, then land. And then after that, that's, you know, first flight on, on Mars, and then it'll kind of take off and start start messing around and see what they can see on Mars. So look for stuff. Larry thinks next week, early next week sometime will be ingenuity. Um, the place, you know, just Mars 2020, and NASA, there's a NASA site that tells you, you know, what's going on. stuff. So if you don't know where, where to go take a look, Mars 2020 is the place to be. Next one. Uh, I don't know if we have any other um, club related announcements to make. I'm, I'm not aware of anything, but uh, I think we can transition to our, uh, our, our guest speaker. Melanie, you want to do the intro? Cool. All right, guys. We are super, super lucky to have an awesome lady. I met her a couple of years ago uh, with um, doing... Um, we had a high school student who wanted to do um, his senior capstone project on exoplanets. And so I asked around to find somebody that was versed in exoplanets to be able to help this young man and to be able to kind of guide him through his research. And I was pointing to Dr. Michelle Creech Eekman, who is a physics, of, um, who is a professor of physics at uh, New Mexico Tech down in Socorro. And uh, she works at the Magdalena Ridge Observatory a lot. And she uh, has helped design some stuff to be able to, to test and you know a piece of equipment that she's gonna talk about that uh, for exoplanets. And she's done stuff with the, the inferometer at, at Magdalena Ridge and just done a whole bunch of really cool stuff right down south. And I just noticed this afternoon on the news that Sunspot is opening back up again to the general public. So maybe it won't be too long before the MROI is going to be able to open up again for us to go down and see stuff. You know, but I think right now she was talking to us that the VLA is open for a walkabout, but you just can't go inside the, the build the little museum building, but it's still open for, and so her haunts down there and she's promised that if we go down and visit that she'll show us around, which would be super fun. So Michelle, Dr. Creech Eatman, Thank you very, very much for taking time to talk to our club about your work down at New Mexico Tech. Oops, I can't hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay now? 
Yes, Great. and All everybody right. else mute your stuff. Yeah, everybody's uh, muted. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and uh, I am used to using the chat. So if people want to stop me in the chat, I'll open that up as well. Um, so that if you have questions along the way. Uh, so I'm going to mainly confine my, my comments this evening to the uh, interferometer. I'm not going to talk about the exoplanets, Melanie, but um, maybe another time you guys can invite me back when we've got some more good data from the exoplanets and I can tell you guys about the exoplanet work that I'm doing. Uh, it's quite a treat. I'm using the Hale telescope out in California to do the exoplanet work. So I'm sure many of you know what, about the Hale. Um, so this evening, I'm just going to be speaking about the Magdalena Ridge Observatory interferometer and um, specifically about the kind of science that you can do with infrared interferometry. And this will be going on here in New Mexico pretty soon, we hope. Um, I'm speaking as the project scientist for the Magdalena Ridge Observatory. I started at New Mexico Tech in 2003 uh, after finishing a couple of postdocs at uh, California Institute of Technology and the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, in the meantime, I got my tenure and I'm a full professor of physics now down at New Mexico Tech. Uh, since, um, oh, it's probably been about six or seven years now. Um, our collaborators on this project are at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Um, and right now we're getting our funding through the Air Force Research Lab. And so that's kind of all the, all the little bugs in the corner uh, for you to uh, know who all, all our affiliates are here. So um, I will start uh, telling you about why we care about interferometry. Um, I start with every astronomer's favorite diagram, uh, which of course is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. It is the reason we are all here. And of course you all understand the double entendre of why this is the reason we're all here, since the stardust is what we're made of, as Carl Sagan pointed out many years ago. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the kind of the holy grail for a lot of astronomers like me who like to study stellar astronomy is, is actually being able to look at more than just the one that's right next door. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the promise of a nice HR diagram like this one is that it gives you this feeling for the size differences for the different stars, along with all this other great information that we use when we teach about the, the sizes of the radii and the, and the colors embedded over the top so that you can infer the temperature scale and the actual, um, you know, all, all kinds of things about um, you can add uh, anything about uh, pulsation instabilities for the instability strip through here, for instance, or uh, other kinds of information that you might want to add to this. The, the masses are indicated on here at some level, and they intersect at another direction. And so, of course, this is kind of the holy grail for stellar physicists um, to be able to, to prove that many of these things are real in more than just a um, an indirect way, the way that we have to when we only use photometry and spectroscopy to do a lot of these images. And, and um, so that holy grail comes from having more resolution. So I'm gonna try to convince you why you should care about more resolution by uh, going through a case study. Um, this is a, an, a, a theorist conception of what a young star forming out of a disk of material uh, with small planetismals or, or small planets starting to form out of that as the material collapses toward the center to become a star. And so um, if you actually use the Hubble Space Telescope, and this, this picture is probably 15 years old now, um, this is a Herbig Harrow 30, HH30 object, and it happens to be an edge-on YSO disk. And uh, you've got 200 astronomical units on here for scale so that you've got a, a pretty good idea of the size of this. This was taken with the WIFPIC2 camera on the Hubble. And um, these green things that are shooting out are actually uh, some excited lines of probably oxygen that are coming out of the disk as the young star material is collapsing here at the center. Um, this doesn't, you know, it's, it's a beautiful picture. It gives you a good idea of the flaring of the YSO disk, um, but this is a huge scale. 200 AU is you know, well over the size of where most of the stuff in the solar system is. So let's say that we wanna zoom in on this. Um, and uh, we just zoom in on the picture. And now of course you start to see the pixelation that's part of the WIFPIC2 camera. And the, the pixels are, are themselves pretty big. And if we zoom in again, 
uh, you can start to look at the throat of where this YSO is supposed to be. But in fact, if you want to look at one astronomical unit at the distance that HH30 is, then you're talking about a little tiny dot. I've lost my arrow I'm trying to find it again. A little tiny dot right here, uh, much smaller than the size of a pixel. And that's just one astronomical unit. So the distance, obviously, from the sun to the Earth on average. That at the distance of HH30 would require a telescope 250 meters in diameter to be built in order to be able to see that. And, and so, of course, that's off the table. We don't have the kinds of technology that are required to build a monolithic telescope of that size. I mean, right now, the United States is uh, in the process of, of finishing up something called the Decadal Survey in Astrophysics that we do every 10 years to try to decide what the priorities are in, in the field. And um, they're talking about building something on the order of 30 to 40 meters to put at Mauna Kea. So um, we're getting nowhere close to a 250 meter diameter scope. We do have things that remind us that we can do this, however, uh, the very large array out uh, just past Socorro, about one hour west, uh, is one of the largest telescopes in the world, actually, and it's an interferometer, it's a radio interferometer. Um, and so this is a nice overhead picture of it. It's, it's probably an older picture, actually, because they've got a lot of new buildings over here that I, I, I got to uh, give a tour of it last year before COVID hit to some um, to some colleagues that came out to visit and uh, it was um, more built up than this. So this must be an older picture of the VLA. But this is basically the best that we can do right now um, as astronomers, uh, if we want to get to those kinds of sizes, to get to the spatial scales that are needed to actually look at individual stars themselves, we need something like an interferometer. And so um, if, if you're not familiar with the VLA, I'd be really surprised because you guys are all astronomers, but um, it's, it's a little bit past Socorro to the west, and uh, the Array Operations Center for the VLA is actually co-located on the New Mexico Tech campus. So if you've never been to New Mexico Tech, uh, it's, it's right across the street from most of the teaching buildings is where the VLA Operations Center is. Um, if you were on your way driving out on the 60, west of Socorro to get out to the VLA, you would pass some mountains just to the south of you. And that's actually where the Magdalena Ridge Observatory is located up here on top of these mountains. So I don't know how many folks have, have been there. Um, the interferometer is at about 10,500 feet. Um, so it's a fairly high altitude site. And uh, of course, there are good reasons for doing that. And you all know what those are. So I'm going to jump ahead and talk about uh, what interferometry does and how it works so that we get kind of a feel for what it is that we're trying to do. The idea is to synthesize the aperture of a much larger telescope by using small telescopes and uh, collecting the light at a multitude of small telescopes and then bringing them together and doing some fancy math against uh, the light that we've collected so that we can recreate the image that um, would have existed if we'd been able to fill the entire space with telescopes. And so this is actually a picture of the coast interferometer uh, out at Cambridge University that our, our collaborators worked on. Um, they had small telescopes, uh, 50 centimeter telescopes that they had on little trailers and they could move them around a little bit to different locations and be able to collect the light. And so I'm just using this as our example. If the distance between two telescopes is the baseline, um, and you're trying to look at, um, you know, imagine your star is way off toward infinity towards my MRO tag up here in the picture, then um, the light is going to come to this telescope before it gets to that telescope. And so in order to put the light back together again, we're going to have to delay it. So in uh, optical and infrared interferometry, we actually use physical delay lines, and I'll show you some pictures of those in a bit. Um, I like to call them optical trombones because they slide backward and forward with mirrors so that you can add the path difference that's required to match this baseline so that you can bring the light together fully in phase again. And so uh, we bring the light together on, this is what the VLA folks will call a correlator. I call it a beam splitter. And then I focus it down on a, onto a detector. And just like with Young's double slit experiment that you learned about in your high school physics class, we get fringes on the detector. And it's those fringes that we use to recreate the images. Now, in optical and infrared interferometry, we have to do all these measurements in real time. Uh, we're not able to do what the, what the radio folks do, which is to use something called a local oscillator at each one of the telescopes and bring the light together 
later on uh, using computer control. So we actually have to match all the path lengths to within about one micron so that we can uh, bring the light together to make the fringes on the detector itself. And so uh, there's lots of very fast calculations that have to happen um, in order to be able to make this all work. And so we call this kind of combination where it's real time and fast homodyne combination rather than heterodyne combination. Uh, any questions on that? I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into the interferometry now. Um, can get it to go. Um, so if if you have an interferometer and this picture just just shows a radio interferometer, it works the same basic way. Uh, and you're looking at a pair of objects in the sky. So this is a, a brighter star and a slightly dimmer star that make up a binary in the sky that you're looking at. You can actually treat uh, the response that each one of the antennas has to each one of these bright um, and, and dimmer spots as being considered as, as two individual sources. And so you can look at what the antenna pair does looking at the bright source, and it will produce um, some fringes for you with a particular amplitude and a particular phase offset compared to the zero path delay length, which would happen if, if the object were directly overhead rather than off at an angle the way that it's shown here. And then if you do the same thing with, the, with this interferometer pair and you look at the fainter source, I've lost my arrow again, here it is. Um, and you look at the fainter source here, you're gonna get a different kind of response. It's fainter, so the intensity is lower and it's in a slightly different position in the sky. So the phase offset is different. And so when you combine these two things in foyer space, you get this as your answer for looking at this binary pair. And this is perfectly reasonable as an answer to use to be able to recreate the binary that you looked at if you knew you were looking at a binary and you had a binary where you knew that one member was a little bit brighter than the other one, then you could back out all the information that's implied by each one of these individual measurements and be able to figure out what you're looking at. But when we work at optical and infrared wavelengths, um, we have some problems doing this. One of the problems that we have is that the Earth's atmosphere is constantly messing up our phase. And so it's actually traveling over the top of the telescopes. We call it a phase screen. At about five milliseconds, it changes. And so it makes it very difficult to make measurements when the sky is changing that quickly for us. And of course, it's the same kind of thing that causes the twinkling that we all know about as astronomers. And so we have to do another trick in order to be able to pull out the information that we want here, which is that we need at least three telescopes working together to be able to overcome this issue. And the idea is you imagine that you've got a patch of nasty sky over the top of one of your telescopes, but the other two are pretty pristine. If you observe the phase, so that's the offset of the sinusoidal wave, um, from each one of them, it's gonna have a component that's intrinsic to the thing that you're looking at, plus a component that's due to the atmosphere. And it's actually due between one and two to this difference in the atmosphere uh, underneath those two um, the patches of air that are measured by those two telescopes. So you can do the same thing between two and three and the same thing between one and three. And if you add all these together, we call that a closure phase between telescopes one, two, and three. And what happens is all the atmospheric pieces drop out and you're left with the intrinsic measurement of the phase on the object that you're looking at. So this is really important for what we're doing because the phase information is the information that tells us the orientation of these two objects in the sky with respect to each other. So uh, the trick at this point, once you've gathered all the data that you've got is to do a Fourier transform. And I'm assuming uh, several of you have probably looked at the math that's associated with Fourier transforms. So um, what we're measuring in the sky is actually in the frequency space. Um, but uh, what we get on the detectors is, is this kind of fringe pattern. And so we have to be able to figure out how to go back and forth between these two. So that when, if we measure one very pristine frequency, we'll get a spike in the Fourier transform. And if we measure something that's got you know, multiple uh, frequencies in it and it's not one particular pristine frequency, then we can get things like wave packets. Um, and if, if you can gather enough information and uh, you have the spatial information to put it back together again, then the stuff that you would measure in the frequency domain looking at the sky can be inverted with the Fourier transform back to the spatial domain and you can actually have a picture again. 
So it's exactly the same thing that the folks do with the VLA. It's just, we've got this one added piece of extra atmosphere over the top of us that makes it harder for us to be able to make the measurement. So we have to make it a lot more quickly. Because we have to make it quickly, we can't see as deep or as sensitively as something uh, at radio wavelengths would be able to see. So I'm gonna stop there for a second and see if anybody's got any questions. Okay. So uh, the next, find my arrow again. Uh, it, the next step in making the image is that actually to build up the images quickly, you want as many telescopes as you can. And so I didn't put the truth image on here. It looks quite a bit like the eight telescope image, but as you combine more and more telescopes together, these artifacts, the, this ringing and, and things that are associated with trying to use the Fourier transforms on, on that frequency domain start to uh, fade away and you start to pull out the actual object that you're looking at. And at this point, when you're getting up to eight and 10 telescopes, you've got enough information that you don't actually have to know what you looked at in the first place. And so we call that model independent imaging. So the number of baselines goes as the telescopes n times n minus one over two, and the number of independent closure phases is n minus one times n minus two over two. And so when you get up to 10 telescopes, you've built up quite a bit. And this is exactly the same reason that the VLA uses 27 telescopes, because it allows them to build up these images very, very quickly. And so we call this a snapshot imaging capability uh, with the interferometer. And this is what we're aiming for with the Magdalena Ridge interferometer is 10 telescopes. So uh, some examples of the different, oh, I have a question. Uh, uh, is there a size distance limit for interferometers? Um, uh, so we don't have to do the transforms in real time. We can save the data that we get on the fringe tracker and I'll show you our fringe tracker in a little bit. Uh, so we can save that data uh, just like you would any other uh, CCD. And um, we could do the transforms to that after the fact, but we have to have done the delay compensation and all the path length compensation well enough that we're measuring the fringes in real time. And so we have to have gotten everything aligned properly to be able to make the measurement in real time. Um, you can see things uh, associated with the curvature of the earth. There's another uh, interferometer over in Arizona called the Navy uh, Precision Optical Interferometer. And they, for instance, can actually see the effects of the tides in their measurements. They do astrometric measurements of objects in the sky. So these things are ridiculously sensitive when they get to be the kinds of sizes that I'll be showing you for the MROI. Did that help? Okay. So um, these are some examples of interferometric science that um, all kinds of optical and infrared interferometers can do. And this is specific to optical and infrared interferometers um, because the wavelengths that we're working at allow us to look at excited lines uh, in, in the spectrum of the stars or uh, to look at hot dust around the stars a mass transfer, mass loss kinds of activities around stars. And then of course, one of, one of the holy grails for us will be to be looking at black holes in other galaxies and looking at the dust and, and clouds around those black holes. And so all of that is uniquely suited to working in the, in the optical and near infrared. So we'll work between about 600 nanometers and 2.4 microns for the kind of work that we're gonna do up there. We may go to a little bit longer wavelengths in the future, but right now we're gonna start out in that optical and near infrared regime. So I wanted to show you some cool science that's been done with other interferometers because this will give you a taste of the kinds of things that we wanna do with the MROI. So you'll see I've, I've dragged you back to the HR diagram uh, because I'm an astronomy professor and I have to do that. It's required by law. We have to show it a certain number of times a day or they kick us out of the university. So, um, <laughs> so th this HR diagram of course is a theoretical one. Uh, I keep losing my arrow today. This is an empirical HR diagram that was made a few years ago using optical interferometric measurements of stars done uh, with various optical interferometers all over the world. Uh, there are some in California. There are some that have been shut down in various parts of the world, uh, in Australia, in the UK. Um, and then there's the one down in Chile. Um, and so these are measurements that were taken with uh, of almost 300 stars uh, as of late 2016, they kicked out everything that was interesting. So if something was a fast rotator, if it was a pulsator, 
uh, if it was a binary and it was ambiguous about the sizes of the two in the binary, they kicked it out. And, and you see that we have an empirical HR diagram where they've tried to give you a logarithmic sense of the actual size along with the color for these objects. And these are actual measured uh, objects with uh, optical interferometers. So hopefully that gives you a taste of the promise of what's uh, able to be done. Now, most of these interferometers that made these measurements were limited to about eighth magnitude in the infrared. Uh, the MROI is going to be able to get down to 14th magnitude. So you can imagine how much it's going to change this kind of NHR diagram when we can go, you know, six magnitudes deeper. Um, so uh, speaking of rapid rotators, uh, this is some work that was done uh, on rapid rotators over the years. Uh, some of it, this first measurement here that was done uh, of Altair, uh, initially we did it with the Palomar testbed interferometer when I was at uh, Caltech and JPL. Um, and all we were doing was measuring with a, a single baseline interferometer. So all we were getting was size measurements. And now we're at the point with the Chara interferometer, for instance, that they could actually make uh, physical measurements of these different rapid rotators. It, this informs us of a lot of things about the stars that we care about as stellar astronomers. It uh, tells us about the age of the stars. It says something about the magnetic fields. It tells you about the mixing that's going on uh, between the nucleosynthetic center and the surface of the star. And obviously you can tell where the rotation axis has to be because these stars are rotating so rapidly that they're pooched out at their equators and they're kind of flattened between the poles. And so you can see that. Now this was last theoretically discussed in the literature before optical interferometry started making these measurements back in 1924 by von Zeipel. And he predicted something called gravity darkening that would happen at the edges because this part Part of the star is so far away from the nucleosynthetic center compared to the pole of the star that it would actually get cooler and darker as a result. And so this is the model that they derived for Alpha Leo before they looked at it with the, with the char array based on von Zeipel's predictions for an oblate star spinning at that speed. And they can confirm the speeds from things like Doppler measurements. You'll see that our, our unit of measure here is milli arc seconds. So that gives you a feel for the size. This is one milli arc second across here. So two in this direction and two in that direction that we're making the measurements in. And of course, this is what the model for Alpha Leo. And this is what they actually measured on Alpha Leo after they did the image reconstruction. And so you'll see, for instance, that the that the temperature isochrones on the on the or iso sorry, isotherms on the surface are um, coming together in a different location than it was predicted to be seen here. And this tells you about some second order effects that are going on um, in the stars as a result of the mixing and the spinning that's happening. So we have new physics now as a result of these very simple measurements of, of rapidly rotating stars. Uh, and these are all well-known guys, obviously. These are all very bright. Regulus, Altair, Aldebaran, Beta Cass. They're all the brightest ones in many of their constellations. So this is just a taste of what can be done. Um, arrows again. Whoop. I gave you the preview too quick. Uh, so uh, there was a stellar eclipse of Epsilon Origi, which maybe some of you participated in. Um, there was a campaign that was encouraged by Bob Stencil at the University of Denver through the American, uh, through the AAVSO um, and the AFOEV over in France to try to get as many measurements as they possibly could as they got close to the eclipse again for Epsilon Origi. It's a 27 year eclipse event with a two year duration when it happens. And so uh, the consensus model from the previous eclipse was that they had a brick that was passing in front of an F0 star because that was all they could understand about what was going on. Here's the solar system drawn to scale. So this was their best understanding of what was happening back at, after the 1985 eclipse. And uh, Bob started a campaign. Bob was my uh, PhD advisor at the University of Denver. Uh, he started a campaign to be able to uh, make new measurements of Epsilon Origi uh, with interferometry. Unfortunately, our interferometer here wasn't ready to go by then. Um, and so, gosh, this thing is just not behaving for me tonight. Here we go. 
Uh, these were the measurements that were taken with the Chara array. Uh, they started in pre-eclipse, so this is a quarter of an AU bar, and you see the milliarc seconds here again. And then uh, that big nasty fire hit up on Mount Wilson, and they almost weren't able to be able to make the measurements at all. So the, the fire happened between this measurement and that measurement. But they were able to finally get back on. The firefighters were able to put all this nasty stuff out, and they got to catch uh, the, the very beginning of the ingress and then the, the entire eclipse. And there's actually movies on the internet Internet, which don't belong to me, um, that show the entire uh, eclipse event as, as this brick, which is a, a big uh, optically thick disk of material around supposedly another star. And we haven't been able to measure the other star that's at the center of the disk uh, yet, uh, passing in front of this F supergiant. So this is kind of the new artist conception of what's going on there. Um, uh, yeah, there is kind of a Coriolis force on rapid rotators, actually, Steve. Um, Interesting. But, but there, there's a there's some second order effects there as well because of of uh, things like mixing length and convection going on in them as well, and so that it makes it really messy to model them, um, which is why von Zeipel only went just so far in the in the twenties. With computers, they could obviously do a lot uh, more predictions nowadays. So this is Epsilon Arigi. I'm I'm trying to be cognizant of the time here because I could talk all night and you guys probably don't want to listen to me all night. Um, this is a wolf ray a binary system. And so uh, prior to um, the uh, measurements that were taken, this was done with aperture masking at the Keck telescope on one of the Kecks where they basically used separate segments of the Keck to make a small 10 meter interferometer out of one of the Keck apertures. And this was done by Peter Tuthill in the early 2000s. Um, so prior to this image being taken as basically a face on of the binary system uh, from overhead, uh, they had no clue what was going on. When they would look at the spectroscopy, it was all muddled. When they would look at the photometry, the, the variations that they were seeing didn't make sense. And so nobody had a really good model of what was happening. And then uh, Tuthill and his crew came along. They took these measurements. And sure enough, this is the new interpretation of what's happening. So down here at the throat of this thing that looks like a spinning shrimp, we have an OB star uh, that's got material flowing off of it. And it's being hit by a shock front that's coming off of the Wolf Ray A star next to it. And as the material slides out, uh, it expands away from the system. And that's what gives you that kind of spiral. This is about a 120 day orbit, I think, uh, that this goes around. And so uh, just, you know, taking measurements over about a year, they were able to get the actual um, rotation of the entire system. And so this is key evidence for this model comes from the interferometric pictures that they were able to take with the Keck. Uh, here's another fun one. Uh, this is um, uh, an image that was done by one of our collaborators, uh, again using aperture masking uh, by Dave Busher in the 1990s um, of uh, a supergiant. And uh, this is uh, here is 20 milliarc seconds is the scale to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, today, folks like Freytag uh, model uh, what they expect supergiants to look like when they're bubbling away. And uh, these are the kinds of images that we would like to be able to take someday to watch the convection cells turning over on these surfaces. And so, you know, it's great to have the computing power to be able to do these kinds of things and to study stellar convection or mass loss coming off of these kinds of systems. And uh, the MROI will be particularly well suited for these kinds of studies. And so um, there are people that are doing studies like this with the Chara array and the VLTI today, uh, particularly using star spots as diagnostics, not only of the magnetic fields, but also of the rotation and the differential rotation of the stars. And so this is an image that was taken in uh, CO lines um, from uh, the VLTI interferometer in the Southern Hemisphere using the AMBER instrument. And this one uh, is uh, what they call an ITOF projection of the entire star of um, uh, Zeta Andromeda. Uh, which is a solar analog star. And so they were kind of surprised to see, based on these uh, images that they were able to take and looking at the spot motion, that uh, this star doesn't have a solar dynamo in it. And so th there's, again, new physics coming up here that we don't fully understand at this point that uh, we need to dig into. And interferometry is well positioned to help us try to understand what exactly is going on here. 
So just some tastes of things. So all of this great science is what we base our science case on for the MROI. Um, my spinning shrimp stopped spinning again. Um, we kind of have a, a three-pronged um, science case here. One of them is active galactic nuclei. So that's, of course, the, the huge black holes at the centers of external galaxies. Uh, getting down to an H-band magnitude of 14 gives us access to over 100 of these. And so we will be able to do things like look at the unified model and start to understand the nature of the nuclear and extranuclear starbursts around these things. This top picture is actually just a model of what people think an AGN might look like edge on. These other three I showed you, well, I showed you these two, I didn't show you this one. These are all actual interferometric uh, images that have been taken with various interferometers. So this one was taken with Keck aperture masking, as was this one. The blue star at the center was taken with the IOTA interferometer. This is a, a star forming region. Uh, it's not quite face on. It's got a little bit of a tilt about 25 degrees. Um, this is uh, Lick H alpha 101. And then this is Epsilon Origi down here with the beam size superimposed for you. And so there's all kinds of great things we can do with star and planet formation. Hopefully we can start to see the clearings around stars as they're forming, which will indicate the presence of planets being formed. We can look at the emission lines in the jets uh, and uh, start to study magnetic accretion and magnetic channeling and the outflows, uh, find those substellar companions, understand something about how these disks are made. And then my favorite area is, is all the, I'll call it the potpourri of stellar physics down here. So we can study things like accretion, mass loss and magnetic fields in stars, um, looking for convection, uh, bipolarity, uh, collimation of outflows. And uh, I work on uh, Myras and Cephids, so pulsations in Myras and Cephids to actually see if they're radial pulsations or if they're pulsating in you know, different kinds of breathing modes with other kinds of things happening to them. And then of course I showed you some of the star spots and oblateness that can happen here. So these are the kinds of science cases that get opened up once you're able to actually start measuring stars uh, down at the stellar surface itself. So the interferometer. Um, hopefully some of you have been up there over the years. If you haven't, uh, I look forward in the future to giving you all a tour. Uh, it's about one hour west of Socorro at about 10,500 feet. We completed the environmental impact survey with the federal government and the Forest Service back in 2003, which was when we were allowed to start building up on the mountain. Uh, there are actually two facilities up here off in the distance is a 2.4 meter fast tracking telescope. Uh, it was made from a, a legacy Hubble mirror that didn't get launched into space. So I don't know if you remember back at the time when Hubble was being launched, there were several mirrors that were made. Uh, we ended up launching the one that had the needed the eyeglasses, but there were others that were left behind on Earth and this one was a good one. Uh, and so it's been put in this 2.4 meter telescope. In the foreground here is a picture of the interferometer building uh, as it looked probably about eight years ago now. So this is where the beam combining facility is. And this is actually the delay line part of the facility. Um, it will uh, consist of 10 uh, afocal 1.4 meter movable telescopes that will be laid out in this equilateral Y configuration on 28 different stations. And so we can move the telescopes between stations. There will be one in the center and nine down each arm. I've told you that it works in both the optical and the near infrared. All of our fringe tracking will be done in the near infrared. Uh, because the near infrared light is more well behaved than the optical light when it comes to the turbulence from the atmosphere. The baselines will vary uh, based on where the pad separations are from 7.8 meters out to 347 meters between the two that are the farthest apart, which gives us a range of spatial scales of 58 milliarc seconds when we're in the tight pack configuration out to a third of a milliarc second when we're in the farthest configuration. So we're going to be able to measure things at sub milliarc second regimes on, on the stars that we're looking at. And the entire design has been optimized to do this kind of imaging that I've been showing you. 
So there's a flow down from the science to the technical requirements. And so these are the technical requirements that we have. The telescope diameters are set to be 1.4 meters so that we can get down to this 14th magnitude group delay tracking limit for fringe tracking. The spatial scales uh, are what set the baselines that I talked about. We're gonna use moderate to high spectral resolutions for interferometers. And we do that by separating the fringe tracking on one instrument and the and the science on a different instrument so that we're never borrowing light at the same wavelength to use it on two different instruments so we always do uh things in kind of monochromatic light so what i mean by that is that the fringe tracking if it's at k band then we can do the science at the optical or j or h and if we're doing the fringe tracking if we want to do a science at k band then we need to do the fringe tracking at h band and so we're never borrowing the light between various instruments. We have very high throughput to achieve the sensitivity limit. And so we have only 15 reflections from the primary of the telescopes to the detector themselves. And that allows us to get 13% throughput on the entire system for the light. So we kind of worship at the altar of the photon, as it were. Um, we have optimized the coatings in the system uh, for things like polarization, phase, and reflectivity across the entire wave band so that we're not losing any light uh, anywhere that we don't need to use, lose it. Um, and we have a large number of telescopes for this model independent imaging. We've tried to apply lessons that have been learned at other interferometric facilities uh, whenever possible. And our, our uh, distributed team at New Mexico Tech and Cambridge University actually has experience with other interferometers, including COAST, uh, SUSE down in uh, Australia, which was just decommissioned last year, the Keck interferometer, which I worked on, uh, Chara, Enpoi, and PTI, which is another one that I worked on. And so uh, we've got a lot of expertise within the team, probably more than 50 or 60 years of experience using interferometers. So pretty baby pictures of good things that we've got up on the ridge. This was the first telescope several years ago when it was delivered. Uh, we didn't have the dome ready yet. And so we assembled the telescope in our uh, visitor center. Uh, we have a maintenance facility attached to the backside of it. And so we assembled the telescope in the maintenance facility. And then this is looking out the garage door, which points to the north at night so that we could actually do some light on on the sky on real stars to test out how the telescope was working the telescopes are being made by a company called amos which is uh, located in belgium i told you they have 1.4 meter diameter they're altitude altitude mounts so they're not your altas or your equatorial mount they're a different kind of mount uh, you'll see that there's there's uh, the fork goes across here and you've got a yoke here and another one this way. We have a Naismith table on the side and the Naismith table is where we do uh, our, our fast tip tilt system. So we actually command the secondary, I've got a better picture where you can see the secondary later of the telescope to do very low order adaptive optics. Um, the, this particular design is polarization preserving. So it means it will actually be able to measure and um, quantify the polar, the polarization uh, signals that are coming from the stars that we're looking at. And when you start resolving stars at the level that we're suggesting, you're going to expect to see lots of polarized signals from the things that you're actually looking at, which tells you something about, um, you know, for instance, magnetic fields or dust in those systems. Um, so the tip tilt secondary uh, is made by a company called Physique Instrumente in uh, Germany. And if you know about PI, you know they're very expensive. So we have to get in line and wait for our hexapods, for our secondaries. Um, and the first light was actually achieved in the, in the maintenance facility in November of 2016. Um, our uh, dome arrived uh, about a year and a half later. Um, and uh, this is this is the enclosure. It looks squat because it is squat. Uh, they're being made by a group called EIE, uh, which are located in Italy. They both house and transport the telescopes. So when we want to move those telescopes between pads, we pick these up with a reach st reach stacker, which is the same uh, device that's used at uh, ports to pick up containers and put them on ships. And so we pick up the entire telescope and dome together with a reach stacker and relocate it to another pad. And that is uh, supposed to take four hours. We haven't tried it yet, but we're hoping to try it here in, a, in another year and a half or so. Um, so there's a question. 
<laughs> it is interesting that Christian Huygens hail from Belgium, I agree. Uh, the squat design is done on purpose uh, so that when we're in the tight pack configuration, the telescopes actually only have 10 centimeters of space between them when they're in the close pack configuration between the domes. But this allows us to do six hours of continuous tracking without vignetting on the neighboring dome. Um, you see these louvers here, this louver design allows us to vent quickly to the atmosphere so that we can equilibrate the temperature inside the telescope with outside. Uh, because this is an interferometer, we can't have uh, lots of cooling like with, with air conditioners and things up there because it would shake everything too much. Um, there's embedded metal mesh in the, in the dome itself to protect us from lightning strikes. Uh, we lift it with uh, a crane or preferably a reach stacker. We've only used these with cranes so far. And if you go to the MROI website, there's actually movies of us installing this first one at the ridge. Um, the factory testing was completed in uh, January of 2018. Uh, the site testing was comp no, 2017. Sorry, I put a, should have put the year on here. Site testing was completed in October and, uh, oh no, it, it was 2018 and first light on the array was later that year in 2018. So it took about two years between when the first telescope came and when we finally got the first dome. And part of that is just because we had to uh, do the contracts with different groups of people um, because we couldn't find people that had the expertise to do everything we needed. Uh, some of you may know Colleen Gino down at New Mexico Tech. She's a professional photographer who works on the staff down there. Um, she's also a, an astronomer and she does a lot of the pictures that we have on our website. So um, this is uh, the beam relay system. We're extending it right now. We have seven of the stations installed outside of the total 28 that we wanna put in. And we put in pipes for uh, two of them. All the light is transported from the telescopes in vacuum. And so this is kind of a cutaway of a telescope uh, inched up next to the vacuum pipes. Once the light crosses the Naismith table, it enters a one millibar vacuum pipe and is brought uh, via a mirror into the building and then it goes straight on to the delay line portion of the building. So we have continuous light transport under this one millibar of vacuum uh, from the telescopes all the way to the beam combining room. Uh, this is designed to minimize uh, the, the, these piers to minimize any subsidence and also it's got all the lightning protection built into it so that if we have a lightning strike the strike is not going to be communicated into the building where all the sensitive equipment is. Um, so we've been testing these full beam lines for a few years to look at their behavior because they have a, a cycling behavior day to night as uh, solar light uh, goes across them and, and differentially heats them. And uh, we're building models for how to compensate for that as they cool off after dark in the evening. These are the delay lines. I think they're one of the coolest things about the entire interferometer. Uh, they're an innovative design that was developed by our friends at Cambridge University. Uh, this is a carbon fiber tube that maintains the distance between, this is a secondary on this end and the primary on the backside. So this is a cutaway for you. The primary would be here. The secondary is this little tiny guy there. Uh, the light comes in from the telescopes through the vacuum to the top. It hits the primary, goes to the secondary, back to the primary and back out through the bottom. Uh, the beams are about 100 millimeters in diameter when they enter the delay line. So that gives you a sense of the size of this cart. And then you'll see that there are other two small little holes here. Those are for the laser metrology system. So we have a, a helium neon laser metrology system that travels in the same cart, hits the primary, secondary, back to the primary and back out orthogonal to the science beams. And uh, that allows us to know exactly where the carts are inside of uh, the delay line tubes because this is all done in vacuum as well. So um, some of the cool innovative things about the design, the wheels run on the inside of the pipe uh, themselves. They're compliant wheels so they can go over uh, the bumps in the pipe without uh, communicating bumps to the actual mirrors themselves. Uh, we have a tip tilt secondary to be able to steer the light beam so that it's always coming out at the same angle. And uh, there's a, a little orange wire here, which is an inductive wire, like your inductive charge toothbrush uh, that supplies all the power to the cart so that we're not dragging cables along with the cart. Um, and then the cart speaks to the computers externally, has a small onboard computer, and then it speaks via wireless out the back end to uh, external computers. 
These are the delay line pipes themselves. We have 190 meters of delay line pipe inside the building and it will be 10 across when it's all done. So it's really hard to imagine the majesty of this space uh, unless you're up there walking around. So, you know, think two football fields uh, down and back. You don't wanna forget your wrench at the other end of the building because you got a long walk ahead of you if you go and do that. Um, so this is just one of the delay line pipes that's been installed. Uh, it's about a hundred meters of pipe. And again, Colleen Gino, she did some light painting on it so that uh, she could make it look exciting and colorful because otherwise it just looks like aluminum pipe. So, you know, it's not quite as exciting if you just look at aluminum pipe. It's installed on a technical slab here, and you can kind of see the edge of this technical slab, which is separated from the concrete that holds up the outside part of the building. We don't want to have any a wind buffeting on the building, creating vibrations that gets into the delay lines. And so we have different footings under these different parts of the building. Uh, the, the delay lines themselves compensate both for the sidereal motion of the stars as they go across the sky, or I should say the earth as it rotates under the stars, and also for the atmospheric turbulence that's going over the top of us. Um, these hold the one millibar of vacuum for many weeks on end without issue, and we're expecting to start putting in the second and third pipes later this year. Trolley 2 has been finished at Cambridge University, and it's going to be coming here shortly. Uh, and the optical path delay jitter on trolley two, if you like, if you like numbers, is less than 15 nanometers over any 10 millisecond interval. And it's been demonstrated at the coast uh, interferometer using their delay line pipes to test it out. Let's see. This is uh, the inner part of the inner workings of the, the fridge tracker system. Uh, we call it ICON, which stands for in infrared coherencing nearest neighbors. Uh, beam tra beam <laughs> fridge tracker is what this all stands for. So what we do is we make fringes between telescopes that are sitting right next to each other. And the reason for that is that the, those fringes will be the highest contrast fringes in the interferometer. So we phase up the entire array like a big adaptive optic system. And then we can make any science measurements we want between any of the telescopes. And so this is the guts of uh, the ICON system. It's got three fake uh, beams superimposed on it so that you get a sense of where the beams travel inside. Um, the detectors that we're using are called Sephira detectors. They're infrared photon counting detectors made out of Mercad telluride, and they have to be cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperatures to be able to operate. Uh, we're getting the controllers from ESO. So if you saw those beautiful pictures that were taken with the VLTI of uh, the black hole and the stars around it at the center of the Milky Way uh, that won the Nobel Prize uh, last year. Um, we're using the same detectors and controllers that are used with the VLTI instrument to be able to uh, make our measurements here. So what it will do is it will combine all 10 telescopes. This is the, uh, the artist's conception of what the beam combiner combining all those telescopes looks like on all the pieces of glass beam splitters. This is the actual beam combiner down in my lab. Um, and so we've populated the inner six of the 10 um, uh, dichroics in this system. And then we do all the commands for changing the path links with fast piezos on the outside of all of this. So there was a question in here. Um. <laughs> all right. It's not a question. It's just a, a general terminal uh, facilities point. I think people would love yeah, I would, I would like to share more of these. I'm, I'm very conscientious of the fact that, you know, our, we often don't pay our photographers enough. So I always ask their permission before I do anything uh, to share, to share them except for my science talks. So, so this is, this is what um, our fringe tracker is going to look like when we get it all buttoned up and take it up to the ridge. So we'll be moving all of this up there probably about a year from now. Um, so here's a little bit of the early science that we're hoping to do when we've got just two telescopes and then eventually three telescopes up there. And I'll talk about the timeline here in a minute. But assuming that we've got deeper magnitudes than people can do kind of eighth magnitude today, um, we can start to look at binarity in much fainter systems. And there's lots of applications looking at binaries there. 
we can start using a, a technique called reverberation mapping to look at some of these AGN. So even though we're not able to actually make images yet of the AGN, we can start to understand the reflection of the material as something gets eaten by the massive black hole and reflects out of the system. And we can use the interferometry to get an idea of the size scales for that. Um, we can look at diameters and limb darkening of all kinds of stars, but particularly faint dwarfs and exoplanet host stars. And we can start to study stellar pulsation, and that's just with two. Uh, when we add the third telescope, then we'll finally have that closure phase capability. So the phase ambiguity will go away. And I think we'll start to look at cataclysmic variables and Nova, novae and their active phases as one of the early things that we get to do to see if we can start to measure the actual sizes of those disks around the novae and the white dwarfs. Uh, we can look at stellar rotational elongations. We can start to study non-radial pulsations. And we can look at the young stellar objects to look for disks and openings. So this is a cat's eye view of inside the dome of the, of the first telescope on the array. And this was a long exposure that was taken while the dome was being swung around so that you can actually see how close the telescope, it's only skimming the inside of the dome by about 10 centimeters. So it's very, very close to the inside of the dome when it's moving around there. But this gives you a taste of the kinds of things that we're gonna do. So here's the money slide. Uh, the reason that we're working with the Air Force Research Lab is that the intention is they would like us to look at geosynchronous satellites. In order to be able to look at things in geosynchronous orbit, we need many telescopes because we no longer get the Earth synthesis rotation that allows us to build up those images quickly. And so um, many telescopes is the only way that we can do it. So the funding through the Air Force Research Lab was under a cooperative agreement with the university. It ended last year and it ended abruptly uh, earlier than it was supposed to because there was a snafu in Congress. Perhaps none of you are surprised there was a snafu in Congress last year. Uh, there were several snafus in Congress last year. And so we temporarily had to stop work on all of our work in March of last year and shut down because of the funding snafu. Uh, maybe it was coincidental that COVID hit at the same time and just about everybody else stopped working too. Uh, we've got a new DOD funding line that's coming in and another five-year contract that's being negotiated right now. Uh, there's already six and a half million up at AFRL waiting for us to get this contract in place. And we're expecting that the total contract will be 30 million uh, by the time it's done. This will only allow us to build out the inner part of the array, the inner 13 pads on the array and our first science instrument and uh, the fringe tracker and three telescopes. That's all you get for this amount of money. So this is fairly expensive stuff. A lot of it is concrete and steel. Um, but the cost is about 8 million per beam line. It's probably going to be a little higher than that when we get updated costs from our vendors now that COVID is starting to lift. Um, but we could finish the entire facility for less than 100 million if we had an angel investor who came in, you know, Jeff Bezos or somebody comes in and gives us 100 million. We could be finished in uh, a few years for that kind of money. Um, so future funding after the three telescopes is really um, TBD and how quickly we can build things up is really depends on the funding. Um, we are awaiting the results of the astrophysics decadal survey in the US um, and we're told by uh, the aura community uh, that does optical and infrared professional astronomy in the United States that those results are supposed to be released in June or July. And so we're hoping we put in a bid to the decadal that we'll be able to get money out of NSF to be able to continue building out this array. Um, we anticipate making time available through uh, what used to be called NOAO and is now called Noir Lab uh, for the whole world to use the interferometer once we get the fourth telescope in place. We hired a new faculty member last year to work with me on the interferometer at New Mexico Tech. So I was the, the lone wolf there for about 15 years. His name is Ryan Norris. Um, you should invite him out to speak as well sometime. Uh, he is, is a very young fellow because he just got his PhD a few years ago. Um, and he's an expert in this image reconstruction stuff. So I'll show you one of his cool image reconstructions here in a minute. And if I don't know if you folks follow uh, the American Astronomical Society calendar, but the American Astronomical Society is supposed to be out in Albuquerque for uh, their national meeting in June of 2023. And so we're hoping that we'll have enough good stuff up on the mountain that we can take people up on tours of MROI by, by the time AAAS comes out here. So um, 
I lost my arrow again. This is some of the imagery construction stuff that Ryan does. And so he simulated what Betelgeuse would look like with a 10 element optical interferometer that is MROI in one night of data. This is the kind of image you could get. This, these are the UV points that he would be measuring. These are all the closure phases. And then here's the squared visibility amplitudes. And so it's all of this information that you inverse Fourier transform to get back to this lovely image. And with that, I'll take any last questions you folks have. Uh, has the road been improved? Yeah, we, we uh, worked on the road up there. Um, well, for several years uh, between 2003 and 2008. And so if you went up prior to 2003, then I would say yes. If, if you've got a different comparison date in mind, um, then it depends. <laughs> so we have to uh, roll it every year. Uh, we have rolling equipment that we own at the university. And sometimes we have to fill, especially after monsoon, uh, we'll get road wash happening. But we added almost 100 culverts to the road to help control the water wash, which is actually kind of hubris because trying to control water in New Mexico is silly. But uh, we try to not have the road wash out every single year, and then we try to rebuild it after monsoon. Um, but we do have to have the road in really good condition to take telescopes up there, to take mirrors up there. And so uh, we will continue to maintain it you know, into the future. The Forest Service will not allow us to have it paved, so it will never be a paved road. I was up there, I think, about five years ago, and it was pretty it's not narrow. Gonna it's not going to be any better than that. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know, if you if you take your own four wheel drive vehicle rather than going up in one of those awful buses that they like to do tours in, um, I, I swore I would never go up in one of those buses again because I think I lost about half of my dental work going up in the bus <laughs> that one day. It just shook all the fillings right out of my teeth. So um, I suggest you take your own four wheel drive. It's the best way to do it. When they move the, the, the telescope unit, how does it not, re, not mess up the alignment of the telescope? Uh, it's all designed so that uh, there, there's these big steel pylons that come out of the telescope into the dome, and it's all designed to be lifted up as one unit, and uh, nothing is supposed to be allowed to move. So we had specifications on all of that to be able to, to do those moves. Uh, and so we'll see if we can actually do it in four hours. That's the specification, but you know, there's gotta be humans in the loop to do that. And humans aren't always as fast <laughs> as we would like them to be. So we'll have to see. So I anticipate a club field trip here sometime soon. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. As soon as COVID lifts and the university lets us start to have external visitors again, we can talk about going up there. Another uh, opportunity, Michelle. Excellent talk. Thank you. Uh, I hope there's no test after this talk because <laughs> I've got no shot to pass it. But uh, I know uh, there's been the, when when we have the Enchanted Skies Star Party, uh -huh. typically in the fall. Uh, there's been in the past an opportunity to take a ride up the mountain and take a tour uh, of the observatory, and I, I have not yet taken advantage of that, but. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have to figure out what we're doing with Enchanted Skies. Dan Klingelsmith was a really big part of all of that. And since his passing, um, <laughs> they're struggling a little bit down in Socorro with who's going to take over this kind of work and help do it. So I think once COVID lifts, we're going to start to get a little bit more serious in the department about uh, trying to have the, the physics department have more of a hand in it. And a big part of this is our new faculty member, Ryan Norris. Um, he he what he did, he used to work with the Chara Array for his uh, PhD work. And, and he also did a lot of outreach at Georgia State. And so we're hoping since he lives down in Socorro that he's gonna wanna help us carry the banner and, and start to pick up the public outreach arm a little bit more now that, you know, now that Dan passed. So I worked with Dan on the interferometer for more than 10 years and it, it was a real blow. He went very quickly. Uh, it's heartbreaking. He was a very, very gift, very big gift. He was. Yes, Paul, that's going to be we, what we do whenever we get done recording. We actually post this on our Facebook. Um, no, not Facebook, YouTube uh, page. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully lots of people see it then. Yeah. 
and I'll point it to the kids as well, because uh, it looks like none of them showed up this evening, but a lot of them work in the evening. They're probably um, tired too. You filled up their brains during the day, so. Yep, we always try to do that. <laughs> Make their heads explode. Well, Michelle, very impressive, very impressive uh, Thank presentation. Thank you so much for sharing us. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Yes, yes. Thank you again so much, Michelle. Do me a favor, send me your um your snail mail address unless you want to meet at Starbucks again. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and, can... and your t-shirt size. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I will do that. Happy okay. to. Great. You have to have club swag all over the all over the place. Just yeah. saying. <laughs> and and I think Melanie and Steve both have my email. So if other questions come up and, and you're like, what was that thing you talked about? Um, I'm happy to answer them, so. We'll have to have you back later on in the year, maybe about exoplanets. And then you can like maybe later on, like in the fall and you can kind of fill us in on how things are going. You bet, I'd be with happy the inferometer. to. Yep, I'd love to. And okay. we'll we can snag your, your guilty, your new guilty party to you, just throw him <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, no, these, these young people have lots more energy than I do. So it's good to have new, new young faculty coming to the university. It's always great. I'm going to sign off now. Um, uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much again, Michelle. I appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. She was cool. <laughs> She was talking to the kids and she was saying, I, I talk fast. I'm like, I listen fast. It's okay. <laughs> that was so easy very, for very her cool. to say. <laughs> hmm? That was easy for her to say. I, we had Dan. He came to Magnolia uh, star parties that I always go to. And uh, um, boy, I learned a lot from her. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, be able to master all of that. But um, I really had the wrong conception of it. And so it was really interesting uh, to hear what it what it actually does. Um, yeah, it's. I was telling somebody about it, and uh, I told them maybe after this lecture I could explain uh, what it does. So I can I can do that a little better now. And point them to our our YouTube page too. It'll be up there in the next day or so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that sounds good. What What is that? What is that? If I wanted to watch it again, where do I go to? Your Facebook? Uh, no, it's the YouTube, our YouTube page. Oh. I'll send out to the members. I'll send out the link. Um, Darren made a, a, a YouTube page because the, the Facebook page um, couldn't handle the, um, the video feed. Okay, yeah. I'll have him send out the link to, um, to, to our, our, you know, our YouTube page. Great, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That works. Since I just talked to him under, under him under the bus. And like, <laughs> yeah. I wonder why more women don't go into science. I mean, these women are just incredible. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, Nova this week had um, a two hour program about women in science and how they are harassed and not um, promoted. And I, I recommend that everybody see this. It was very, very good. Yeah. But that, that's why women go into science. This is what they said. Women go into science, but, but they'll, they, they lose them as they go into field work and start working in, in uh, because of the harassment from men. Yeah, Michelle said for a very long time she was the only female at Tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They start out with, you know, 30%, I don't know this, I don't remember what they said, but say 30% women in the class. And by the time four years are up, there's 7%. I mean, it, it just goes down. It was a real interesting program if any of you have a passport. In fact, I think it's on to, uh, Sunday mornings about 11, Nova repeats on five or nine. 
Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I, I know I've read some of the early books on astronomy, and uh, they they pay, they paid uh, women uh, less. Actually, some of the women that made some of the greatest uh, discoveries. Um, I think one of the books was the glass ceiling or something like that. Yes, mm -hmm. that I read, and uh, I hope it's improved since then. I mean, there's so many brilliant women; uh, it just uh, boggles my mind uh, their capacity for for science. So I hope I hope things have changed. Uh, you had a question, Steve? Uh, yeah, no. I don't know if it, but the, the real renaissance in interferometry that's been going on, and you know, the, the, at the optical levels, and now there's the space interferometer, and I wondered if anybody knew when that was going to go online. That's a, at least in a constellation of telescopes. I think there's at least three uh, interferometry instruments. Well, I guess there ha there would have to be at least three. So, do you know when that's going to go online? The, no, send that to me in an email and I'll forward it on to Michelle. She may know. Oh, thank you. And then there's, of course, gra gravitational interferometry, so much renaissance there. And I heard they were building a new pipe uh, down at the CERN site. Cool. Yeah, yeah send, send that to me in, in an email and I'll send it on to her. wonder how they can uh, maintain the, the vacuums that they need to operate these things, you know, real pretty high vacuum and be able to maintain that. I had trouble doing that, in, you know, in a laboratory with a vacuum pump, uh, you know, as a chemist, you know, how do you, how do, you do that on these huge scales with uh, I don't know, maintaining a high vacuum for the amount of time they need to do it? Just mind boggling to me that they could do that. Yeah, I, I got a tour when I went with the uh, uh, with the Star Party. We went up there, and uh, they explained some of this. So I was uh, very lucky to uh, uh, get it on on the uh, on the tour. So, uh, but I only uh, I learned uh, part of it. So this this really, I was really fascinated tonight with uh, with all this. Uh, and and, they, and they, they take you through. Uh, you got to take the tour because uh, they take you through all these buildings and everything and you, you march right through the secret parts and everything. And uh, I, I think you'd love it. Uh. So once did you guys know, you know, she said there's a hole now that Dr. Klingel Smith is no longer there. What do you guys think as a club to help Socorro to put on the Enchanted Sky Star Party? Of course, I like to go anyway. But <laughs> do you know what uh, would be entailed, Melanie? What what would happen? I don't know. Happen? You know, I don't know whether it's involved with getting just logistics, or would it be involved getting speakers? You know, I I don't know all what Dan did, um, but I I could ask her. So all right, look, I'm not sticking our our neck out and saying we're gonna, you know, volunteer. But what you know, what help do you need? Because it's a really, I've never been, but I've always wanted to go and I hate to see it go away if, um, you know, if, if, if it involves just helping them gather it back together again, because Dan, Dan was, was okay. And then all of a sudden he wasn't, and then he was gone. And, and so it's kind of, you know, not a whole lot of um, groundwork was laid to help his, help him, his replacement come along. Maybe you could talk with John Briggs. Yeah. Because he's been involved in that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good, point. good point. That's another good trip to see his telescope. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. I, I want to go. I, you know, yeah. yeah. I've gone a couple times and it's really fun. Yeah, they this usually uh, that keeps talking. She's one of the volunteers at the Museum of Natural History who should become a club member, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I am a club member. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Sorry. I didn't see well, that. I, I just the... joined, so I forgive you. No, I, I joined about okay. a few weeks ago. Okay. Uh, I thought I better join this. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know uh, what uh, Dan's role was. He would uh, show up every year and, and give lectures and stuff. Uh, I knew the original guy that started at John Spargo, and uh, but they said that they, they, he kind of got phased out as he he got older and they took over. But um, they they seemed to always have a, gr a great group of people there that that operate it. But I'm sure they would welcome uh, some some uh, help. It's it's just a great time. It really is. It's uh, you... Dan was Michelle's cohort. Dan Dan and Michelle <laughs> taught at um, New Mexico Tech. He. Yeah. Um, Called himself Dan the Astro Man. Yeah, yeah. He he would always come out and uh, and explain stuff to us. He'd give a lecture and uh, and give tours up on on a mountain there. He had a hat that was kind of like a little skull cap, and this big big uh, thing went went out to a hula hoop, and it was he was Saturn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just a fun group of people. I'm I'm sure they'll uh, keep it going, and they and uh, they would love to have some some input. Uh, sometimes, if the weather's not great, sometimes it's a small a showing of people. So, um, uh, although you might ruin it for me, because um, Marsh is unusually lucky, and and we usually uh, win all the stuff at the at the. Um, uh, the raffle tickets and uh, last year we really make a killing I win eyepieces and all kinds of stuff they get all this stuff from uh, from all these manufacturers uh, when they tell them they're going to have a star party and uh, last year I think I got uh, or whenever the last time was uh, 70 by 15 binoculars and and then Marsha won a pair of binoculars too so they let us trade one in and I bought um, like a hundred dollars worth of stuff out of the store cool uh, yeah, they let me, uh, they came up to me and said, you know, you don't need both of those. Do you want to trade one in? So they have a little store that comes and, uh, and, uh, and then they try to uh, get a food, a uh, food cart uh, going where uh, if you want to stay there and eat and it's, uh, it's, it's really a lot of fun. It's, it's a great party. I agree. I've been to, uh, to there probably twice and enjoyed it both times. It was, uh, it's a really nice place to camp out. And... Yeah, yeah. With John Briggs there, I mean that's an awesome addition uh, to to the whole thing. That uh, and and he always brings a lot. Uh, I think he you know connects with some of the speakers, and uh, brings a great uh, uh, group of people. And some people from uh, uh, what do they call it? A, uh, the uh, uh, Albuquerque Club come in and and give uh, talks and stuff. Yeah, it's it's a great a great thing. Yeah, I, I could easily see, uh, you know, some a, a few task members being interested and willing to, you know, pony up some hours to go down there and get something set up and organized if that's what it takes to keep that going. Oh, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. We just need yeah, I mean, to advertise it. We could work together and, and do that because I think that would be, it would yeah. be a shame to see it, you know, kind of diminish. Absolutely. I don't know. This year, obviously, is uh, maybe a, a tough year to get something like that going. By even by October, it's going to be tough to have any kind of star party. But uh, perhaps yeah. next year is what we want to be thinking about. Speaking of events, uh, you probably know that by now, Alcon 2021 has been canceled officially. It's going to be virtual. Uh, Jim told me. Um, okay, but it's not going to be held here in Albuquerque, <clears throat> but we are going to be doing Alcon 2022 in Albuquerque, uh, July of 2022. So stay tuned. It's, we think three times the charm. So, <laughs> so here we go. <laughs> Amazing. Um, crazy we live in interesting times <laughs> so what, what's in what's in mind for a virtual alcon don't know i haven't heard that yeah, jim was talking to the um, i don't know i, I don't want to say president but she's somebody there's somebody that knows it was a, girl, a lady that was kind of like this is what we're going to do it's going to be some um some talks in the afternoons and evenings virtual you know zoom talks okay. afternoon evening kind of things okay. kind of like the um the key west star party was oh carol org is the the league president that's it it's probably who he talked to yeah 
Well, good. I'm glad they're going to do that. Yeah, I just found that out uh, earlier this week, actually, because oh, I was great. talking to my club in Baton Rouge that I used to be a member of, and I uh, actually still am, but um, but she, you know, they, they were going, what, Alcon, because they knew we were Albuquerque, um, so I, they were like, what's going on? I'm like, let me find out before I, because I, I did the talk for them last Monday. Is it going to be dates? Hey, what, Ginger? August. It'll be in July. Okay. July of 2022. Okay. I don't have the actual date here, but I think it's towards the end of July. Okay. Well, John, do you have anything else for us? I think that's uh, that's good for our ending our official meeting if we want to say sayonara on the official meeting. Okay. All right, I will, at your, at your command, I will stop the recording, so. Five, four, three, two, one, and.